Hello, welcome to our video podcast. This is MH Consultants, Breakfast Panther. Thank you for joining us today. We are the partners of our firm, MH Consultants. The M part is Anita Menon here. Many of you will already know her as a successful entrepreneur skilled in all things marketing and sales. Apart from this consultancy, Anita owns a successful marketing business, The Butterfly Effect. And H stands for Ron Howard, and Ron's skills uh, relate to everything finance, accountancy, and corporate governance. Can you tell us a little bit more, Ron? Yes, I can. I've been in Bahrain 25 years. I worked as a financial director of a company for several of those. I've, I've been a consultant on and off. I've also been in Dubai for eight years. Presently, I am running the business school at the British University of Bahrain. And as MH Consultants, we think that our competencies would really benefit business owners and managers to improve the efficiency of their businesses. To reinforce this, we decided to produce this podcast to discuss the problems of SMEs in Bahrain and around the Gulf and provide some viable solutions. We intend to invite distinguished guests to the studio to speak on, speak on important subjects and also invite you, the listeners, to contribute with your views. And this video podcast is going to be posted on LinkedIn, uh, on our LinkedIn pages, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, make sure you follow us at mhconsultants underscore bh. Right, so on with the pod. We call it breakfast banter because we meet for breakfast to discuss the problems and potential solutions facing SMEs while eating together. And you can see the food on the table. Anita is a well-known blogger, so she knows much more about food than I do. Go ahead, Anita, tell me what we're eating today. So today's breakfast is from Crust and Crema. It's one of my favorite places, coffee places here in Sif. And they also have an outlet in Galleria. Um, we've ordered some uh, really tasty uh, halloumi sandwich. There is a pot of oatmeal with honey and some protein powder, I believe. And there is a um, very nice berry acai bowl. Um, and a chicken and avocado sandwich, which I think we'll eat later. Uh, not to forget coffee for me and English tea for Ron. So far, we're really, really happy with our breakfast. Yes, everything gets uh, washed down with English breakfast tea. Halfway through the podcast, we will eat some of these and let you know at the end of it how they taste. Right. So let's begin with the episode today. Okay. There are about 75,000 registered SMEs or small medium enterprises in Bahrain and obviously a lot more than that in the Emirates, Saudi, Kuwait, Oman. For this country, an SME is a company with a turnover of, or sales of about 3 million dinars per year or less and which has up to 100 employees and they work in all sectors of the economy. This series will discuss several of the most challenging problems facing SMEs, but first we need to take into account the economic situation and the context that we're in. Anita, where were you on February 21st, 2020? I really don't remember. Where were you, Ron? No idea either. But I do know that that date was the first recorded case in Bahrain of COVID-19. Coincidentally, on the same date, the World Health Organization gave a press conference noting that worldwide there were only 75,719 cases of COVID in 27 countries and a total of 2,365 deaths. So since then, 16 months later, we, we've all known that we've had 100 and 172 million cases and 3.7 million deaths and yeah. rising. A terrible increase in a short time and a once in a century event. 
The last global pandemic was the Spanish flu 100 years ago that had 500 million cases. So one of the government's roles during a time when economies cease to function properly is to step in. Now, some of you will know who are a little bit older like me that the government or the Bahraini government had previously done this during the Great Recession in 2007-2008 by guaranteeing bank deposits along with other measures. In 2020, the government moved extremely quickly to try to contain COVID and limit, as far as possible, loss of life while maintaining economic stability. This has proved to be a very extremely difficult balance to achieve for all the world's governments. So Ron, what do you think of the government's strategy to combat COVID-19 when it started last February? Government strategy was several fold. It did a lot, included short term lockdowns of areas in the economy where people congregate, such as restaurants, cinemas, hotels, uh, restrictions on tourism. Indeed, Saudi Causeway has been closed now basically since the 8th of March 2020. Uh, fully vaccinated visitors are allowed, but still we're not getting many visitors from Saudi. Uh, fiscal policies were implemented, whose value was equivalent to 30% of Bahrain's annual GDP. That's a lot. So what happened there? Well, loan repayments were suspended. Uh, there were free utilities for a certain period payment of staff salaries by the government, suspension of rents and government fees, and the injection of 100 million dinars directly to companies where it was most needed. Some of these policies remain today, including the recent decision to suspend the payment of loan instalments until the end of this year. These crucial efforts serve to shield both Bahrainis and expatriates from the most damaging economic effects, economic effects of COVID. So Ron, I think I'd like to add something to it. Um, I think government made stupendous efforts in uh, getting the population vaccinated. It started, the drive started in December 2020 and it has been going on so aggressively across the nation. And as of today, more than 80% of the population is already vaccinated, and that, I think, is absolutely commendable. Very good, very good. So now let's talk about uh, what are the industries that were so uh, affected by the uh, economic crisis that happened because of COVID-19. Uh, I think the worst hit were a lot of service sectors like tourism, salon and spas, and uh, a lot of other industries as well. Um, tourism used to bring around 13 uh, percent to the GDP of the country, but now it's one of the worst hit area uh, in the in, in among the industries. Uh, but there were some winners as well. Uh, we had the telecom sector really doing well. People at home, uh, you know, in the lockdown, uh, using data and internet to pass their time. And then there were others like uh, the IT industry and the delivery services and the supermarkets and the pharmacies. Indeed, that's true. But we will focus on those areas or sectors that didn't do so well. So an SME that has suffered from a, a lockdown and because of it, a significant fall in business has several, several strategies it can follow. And we'll discuss those during this podcast and future podcasts. Today, Anita, we're going to concentrate on liquidity. And I think that it's really, really important Absolutely. because a lot of SMEs, not just SMEs, I think literally everybody in the economy is affected because of lack of liquidity in their system. Well, companies don't close because they're making losses. They close because they run out of money. In fact, a company can make losses for maybe two, three years and continue trading. But as soon as it runs out of money, cannot pay its liabilities, maybe can't pay its employees, then it hits real problems. 
needs to conserve cash. Now, we use the word cash to mean financial resources, not just physical cash. So, for an accountant like me, cash means bank deposits, unused overdraft facilities, and loans. So don't think when we talk about cash, it's just physical cash, because it's not. So Anita is, a, as I said earlier, an entrepreneur here with several businesses, and those were open and, and, or, or, and are open during COVID. Have you suffered any liquidity problem? Absolutely. I think uh, I've uh, really had a lot of problems uh, making recoveries from uh, a lot of clients, and that had caused a lot of block in the, in the system. There was no cash flow. It was harder to pay salaries. Uh, it did make a lot of uh, issue, and I think um, we're still you know, coping with that uh, block in the system. And because of that liquidity, you probably had some tough decisions to make and yes. will have to make tough decisions yes. in the future. So let's discuss some ways to improve liquidity. A company can only definitely control one area, and that's what happens internally. So let's look at outflows first. The largest fixed costs are those usually associated with employees. And we can do several things here. First, we need to dis eliminate discretionary spending. That would include overtime. Salaries can be temporarily reduced and employees directed to go on leave until the situation or the operations improve. There's also a decision to be made on whether to reduce the number of employees. Doing that, however, can create two problems. If expatriate staff have been with you for a long time, they usually have some end of service benefit or indemnity that you would need to pay if you let them go. If you do let them go and pay that money, it's an outflow, maybe a large outflow, that the company gets no benefit from. Now, some companies do delay this payment, but that can lead to legal issues. It would may make more sense to instead reduce the employee's salary or send them on local leave while maintaining employment status. Secondly, if a significant number of employees are laid off, they may need to be replaced in future when demand improves. Are you able to easily identify and find the right employee? Many reports in Europe and America suggest there's a labour shortage coming. Indeed, some of the companies I am associated with are finding recruitment of key personnel even more difficult. So be aware of these potential problems. Anita, you said you suffered some liquidity problems. What action did you take regarding employees? Yes, so uh, when we were going through that phase, um, I met up with my employee base and we negotiated if they would be okay to work on reduced salary for, for a very temporary period until things got back to normal. I also asked them to go on uh, a local leave. Apart from that, I also took advantage of the Tumkeen support, uh, which was offered to all the Bahraini businesses um, during this phase. Very wise, very wise. Good idea to take advantage of the Tumkeen support programs. So they are basically the strategies regarding or related to employee costs. Uh, we have others. For suppliers, I've read several articles where companies are encouraged to maintain dialogue with their suppliers. Well, I could tell you, if you're delaying payment to suppliers, they will certainly be regularly contacting you. Yet this strategy is widely used, delay pay delaying payments, because it's basically a free loan. If you pay your suppliers in three months, 
or six months, it will be the same cost. There is no interest charge on suppliers' payments. Most companies delay payments to suppliers, and there is a skill in doing that, stretching the payments for as long as you can without being put on stop for supply. A uh, very difficult skill, but one that your accountants would certainly need to learn. Many companies also give post-dated checks. Sometimes there's no choice but to do that, especially with bank loans, major asset purchases and rents. Uh, we would advise you as much as possible not to give or not to issue post-dated checks. Why is that? Because when the date is there and the check becomes due, the supplier is then in charge of your cash flow. You will end up calling the supplier, please, please don't pay in the check. So as much as you can, to keep control of your own cash flow, do not issue post-dated checks. Do you issue any post-dated checks? Yes, I tariff? have, but for rent only. Only rent? Yes, only rent. Not for suppliers? No. Very good, very good. A third outflow is, of course, uh, if you have loans or overdraft, interest payments and instalments to your loan providers, usually banks. Please always make sure you have a very good relationship with these, with the banks. You will need them not in, only in bad times and good times. Uh, they may not seem very understanding, but you don't want them to pull in the loans. So keep them informed of what's going on. At the moment, you're in a de decent position because the government has delayed the payment of instalments for another six months. If, if you are having problems with your loan providers, contact them in good time, explain your problems, give them some solutions, and try and negotiate extended payment terms. We do have a separate podcast on how to negotiate with banks, plus the type of information that you would need to produce for them. So that's the outflows. How about the inflows? A company needs to maximise its inflows. Our advice here is, if possible, sell in cash. If you sell in cash, there's no need for any debtors, you get the money straight away. And sell from stock also. That stock is already in your warehouse, already paid for. Sell that first. You will not have any outflow, you have to spend anything to get that money back. And then, of course, most of you will sell on credit. I guess, Anita, you do sales on credit? Yes, you because... You have credit customers? Yes, because we are a service company, so we can't possibly sell from stock. What we do is we give a little credit to our clients who are also going through this difficult time, and we know and we trust them, so we, we believe that they will pay in due time when things are better. That's very interesting, you believe them. So, one would need to do some due diligence on that, to be sure, as far as possible, that credit customers can and will pay. This is an ongoing process because a good customer today may not be a good customer tomorrow. We can help you on this, the credit analysis of a company before they become your customer. Where debtors are outstanding, so somebody owes your company money, continually call and chase. Do your best to get in front of the payment queue. Usually the company that is continually in your face, shouts the loudest and most, gets paid first. While this, obviously this behavior creates bad feeling, it is vital in the race to be paid. I think, Ron, it's very interesting you, you bring this up because this is precisely the type of strategy we used in the 100% of the time that we have during the day. 
we have actually devoted 50% of that time to get, a, get the recoveries done. Very good strategy, Anita, but sometimes also those companies that you're continuing to deal with don't pay you on time. That's true. And you need to maybe get a little tough with them. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Now, another method of maximizing inflows is to think about providing additional capital, additional investment. Now, you may decide to do that, but that decision ought to be based on when are you going to get that money back, what profits are you going to make from it, and when. Have you decided or put more capital into the company recently, Anita? To be very honest, no, Ron. I don't think uh, I am that brave at the moment. The climate is still shaky, and uh, I would like to wait and watch before I can make that decision. Now, our next podcast, which we'll be dropping soon, will discuss how COVID has changed and will change working practices. So, Anita, I enjoyed this food, the oats, the halloumi sandwiches, you had all of that, unfortunately. <laughs> While I wouldn't eat this every day, it was different from my usual beans on toast. I love variety when it comes to food, so this acai bowl was absolutely fantastic, very refreshing for the summer, and I think it was excellent all in all. So that's the end of podcast number 1.0. We have more coming up with different issues and topics that we're going to discuss. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to DM us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and also Facebook at mhconsultants underscore bh. Looking forward to hear from you all. Thank you for listening.